Well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for that introduction as well. Um, I also want to mention I've had a bunch of years of experience managing retail stores and glass shops and have bud tended and been a sales rep. So I've been all over the industry. I've done a lot of hiring and managing and I put together a bunch of awesome teams throughout my time here in the industry. Um, let me get into some the screen sharing real quick. All right. Like Caitlin said, this is part three of our webinar series. Um, in our first segments, we went through the queer history of cannabis legalization, as, and then we did the beginner's guide to gender. Today, we're getting into recruiting and retaining diverse talent, which is um, all of our topics have been really important and different in their own way but I'm super duper excited about this one. I feel like diversity in the workplace is incredibly important and um, not just in the cannabis industry, but any industry. Everyone should have a comfortable place to thrive. So let's start off with what is workplace diversity? It's the idea that your workplace should reflect the makeup of greater society. When we think of diversity, people often think about demographics demographic groups like race or gender, but um, there's a lot more to diversity than that. There's two main categories of diversity, inherent diversity and acquired diversity. So inherent diversity is what you're born with. So uh, characteristics like your race, sexual orientation, sex and age. And then acquired diversity is factors that you acquire or develop through life, like education, experience, values, skills, and knowledge. Real inclusive workplace diversity is defined as understanding, accepting, and valuing differences between people of different races, ethnicities, genders, ages, religions, disabilities, and sexual orientations, as well as differences in personalities, skill sets, experiences, and knowledge bases. When I do my hiring in the industry, I try to get quite a mix of both. Your customer base is super varied, so why shouldn't your employees be as well? Uh, managing retail stores, I've noticed different customers respond better to different bud tenders. I love having veterans and older staff members who connect with the older demographic, which is the fastest growing demographic in the industry right now. I love having people of all races and sexual orientations around. Some customers like the bro energy. Some customers are turned off by it. Um, I love having both people with experience and people who are new and excited to break into the industry. When it comes to new bud tenders, I personally find that people with restaurant and coffee experience translate really well into the fast paced, detail oriented customer service work that bud tenders do. Um, they're also used to being trained in, on product knowledge and menus. Uh, and since we're talking about uh, de demographics and diversity, let's talk about who actually uses cannabis. Um, if we look at demographics by gender, we can see that uh, males typically consume more than females. It's true. But um, if we look by age, it's, um, um, usually, it's generally the younger demographic who's consuming. However, um, the over 65 demographic is the fastest growing demographic in the United States. The Journal of Medical Association study claims it grew by 75% from 2015 to 2018. So uh, very important demographic. We really need to make sure that our stores are comfortable for these people to be able to come into and our product is clean for them to be able to consume. Um, if we look at our demographics by race, it looks as if it doesn't really make a difference. Studies have shown that we all consume about the same regardless of what race we are. But because of the war on drugs, black people are disproportionately affected. They're arrested still 3.6 times more um, uh, for marijuana possession than white people. If we look at demographics by sexuality, 
queer people, LGBTQ people use cannabis way more than straight people. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but it makes sense when you think about how sexual minorities are more likely to be bullied. They're more likely to be kicked out of the home as minors, and they're more likely to attempt suicide as well. So queer people are way more likely to use any drug really. And looking at this chart right here from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, queer people use cannabis more than twice as much as straight people. Um, I also want to mention, we'll, we're talking about that, that um, cannabis was legalized by queer people in response to the AIDS crisis, which you can learn more about at the first webinar that we did in this series. Um, but for a moment, I just want to talk really quickly about family brands. Um, the cannabis industry has a lot of family brands. I absolutely love the idea of cannabis brands being a family venture but they could be problematic in a couple of ways. If everyone's from the same family, they don't often have a lot of inherent or acquired diversity. They're usually from the same ethnic background. They're often around the same age. They have a lot of similar experiences and education, and this can produce a lot of blind spots and weaknesses. Family brands can also spell disaster when it comes to nepotism. Um, some, sometimes people are put into positions and they're completely unqualified, but they're there because they're, they are somebody's aunt or they're someone's son. Imagine having sales territory conflicts with an owner's kid. Employees with high potential may leave the company or they may never join because they feel that relatives of the boss may be treated preferentially. Nepotism can also leave you open to discrimination lawsuits. I strongly suggest that if you do have a family brand, make sure everyone is qualified for the position they're in, make sure you're treating everyone fairly, and include employees from outside your family as well in your business. All right, so now the benefits of, of a diverse workplace. Diversity has become a huge priority for recruitment and talent acquisition. There's been a ton of studies that have shown why. Innovation, Forbes Insights has identified workforce diversity and inclusion as a key driver of internal innovation and business growth. Forbes Insights also shown diverse teams make better decisions 87% of the time. At the University of Michigan, research showed that groups of diverse problem solvers outperform groups of high ability problem solvers. Research from Harvard Business School um, found that having multicultural social networks increase your creativity. The McKinsey Diversity Database found gender diverse companies are 15% more likely to have above average financial returns. They've also found that ethnically diverse uh, companies are 35% more likely to have above average financial returns. A study of Fortune 500 companies showed that companies with women board directors have significant higher returns on sales, return on invested capital, and return on equity. A Glassdoor study showed 67% of job seekers say a diverse workforce is important to them when considering a job offer. Companies who focus on prom promoting diversity in the workplace are seen as more human and socially responsible organizations. And in this in small industry like this, a reputation can go a long way. In the Millennials at Work survey by PwC, 61% said they'd actively seek out employers who, uh, whose corporate social responsibility values reflect their own. They also found that 76% of people said that they'd consider leaving an employer whose behavior no longer met their standards.
All right. So why do millennials matter? We became the largest generation in the work in the labor workforce in 2016. And it's going to remain that way for at least another decade. Engagement. Um, Delo Deloitte's study of inclusion found that 69% of employees who believe their senior management teams are diverse see their working environments as motivating and engaging. They also found that 70% of people believe bias they've experienced or witnessed has negatively impacted how engaged they feel at work. And then, of course, retention. Diversity and inclusion in the workplace cause all employees to feel accepted and valued, resulting in lower turnover rates. Cornell University did a, sh a study that showed that being less inclusive in the diverse workplace makes the turnover rate go way up. Now the challenge of a diverse workplace. Managing a diverse workplace comes with its own set of challenges. The benefits of diversity like innovation and creativity are because of conflicting perspectives. And um, that could also be a big challenge. How you um, result or how you resolve these conflicts determine if employee performance will increase or decrease. We'll talk more about that later. Um, well, actually, acquired differences. People who have different skill sets, they produce constructive debate over an issue, and these types of conflict should be talked about, should be debated about, and they should be encouraged. But if it's um, conflicts about inherent diversity, about your race, your gender, your age, um, they could lead to interpersonal conflict. They require more thorough and lengthy communication to resolve and reach a common understanding. And um, they need to be managed carefully to avoid lowering performance and morale. So now let's get into inclusion. Diversity by itself isn't enough. The goal is inclusion. It's often said that diversity without inclusion is exclusion. What does that mean? Well, diversity is who's in the room and inclusion is making sure that everyone's idea has been heard. It's making sure that environment is safe for everyone to feel like they belong. It's also having a sense of belonging, feeling respected and valued for who you are, feeling a level of supportive energy and commitment from others so you can do your best at work. And um, if you're wondering if you're being inclusive, ask yourself if people of diverse backgrounds are in places of power. Are they managers and are they decision makers or are they only in lower level positions like security or trimming? Equality and equity. Now, these concepts are pretty similar, but a lot of people get these confused just because they're, you know, you hear that the goal is equity, not equality, but um, yeah, the, it, it's like pretty similar, but um, I've seen a lot of different examples that demonstrate the differences. Um, there's that fence one, there's one with a bike, but I actually found a new one that I really like um, and I'm going to share it with you now. So inequality is having unequal access to opportunities. The system set so some people benefit more than others. Equality is evenly distributed tools and assistance. These tools can help meet the needs of some, but the system is still tilted in their favor. Even with these tools, it may not be enough for some people to have complete access to certain opportunities. Equity is giving custom tools um, that identify and address inequality. They can meet, uh, it's giving the disadvantaged a little more help to have the same level of access as others. Going back to who's in the room, um, equity is what are the barriers to getting in and staying in the room? Who's trying to get into the room but can't? 
And then finally, justice is fixing the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunity. Recruiting diverse talents. Now that we've gotten all of that stuff out of the way, let's move on to how we find and effectively recruit our diverse people. Let's start with making job postings that attract diverse candidates. The language you use in your job posting is incredibly important. The American Psychology Association did a study comparing job postings with the language considered either masculine or feminine. They found that ads using more masculine wording were perceived by both men and women to have fewer women in the occupation, were perceived by women to be less appealing than the same ad using masculine wording, and led women to have a lower sense that they would be long. Um, what I found really interesting was men showed no difference in anticipated belonging based on either masculine or feminine wording. So what do you have to lose? Wording and job advertisement signals who belongs and who does not. Ads with masculine words reduce perceived belongingness, which leads to less job appeal, regardless of someone's perception of their ability to do their job. 51% of job applicants are more attracted to a company whose job postings contain images and videos. So it's a good opportunity to showcase your commitment to diversity. Include images and videos that sh show that you do just that. Show your rock star, show how diverse you are in your job posting. Have a section on your website that shows your commitment. This is on Microsoft's website. It's beautiful, it's clean, it has tons of resources, and it even has this interactive chart which shows their diversity by employee roles. It shows how it's been increasing across the board over the years. I think this is really awesome and it shows their commitment. Um, Showcase your inclusive benefits. Do you offer benefits for same-gendered spouses, family leave and medical leave, regardless of marital status? A lot of queer people aren't married, but they still have families and children that they need to take care of. So are your benefits inclusive of that? Do you have benefits for transition-related care? We'll get more into that later. Do you offer remote work and flexible schedules? Put it in your ad. Offer workplace policies that are more appealing for diverse candidates. What do diverse candidates want? The number one company policy women are most attracted to is flexible schedules. 23% of employees have quit their job because of a long commute. Millennials really look for having good work-life balance having opportunities to progress and become leaders, and having flexibility, working remotely, and having flexible hours. A lot of this, the workforce has second jobs or side hustles and children, and a lot are having to homeschool their children during this pandemic. I realize there aren't too many positions that can be done remotely in the cannabis industry, but I feel like some positions like marketing and sales can. All right, so non-discrimination policies. Every single company should have a non-discrimination policy that reflects your commitment to treating everyone equally. There are six parts to a really good non-discrimination policy. Clear language that discrimination will not be tolerated. So saying, we will not tolerate discrimination or harassment of any kind. Through enforcement of this policy, we seek to prevent, correct, and discipline behavior that violates this policy. Two, specifics about prohibited behavior. We will not tolerate discrimination or harassment on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, marital status, citizenship, national origin, genetic information, or any other characteristic protected by law. This includes jokes, comments, sexual harassment, or any other kind of harassment verbally or in writing. 
A description of penalties for violating the policy. I think that up to and including termination works just fine. Um, a clear procedure for having an employee for an employee to um, who has experienced discrimination. Individuals who believe that they are victims of, of conduct prohibited by this policy or believe that they have witnessed such conduct should discuss their concerns with their immediate supervisor, human resources, or any other manager they feel comfortable with. We encourage prompt reporting of complaints or, return, or concerns so that quick and constructive action can be taken. And then prompt investigation of complaints of discrimination. Any reported allegations of harassment, discrimination, or retaliation will be investigated promptly. The investigation may include individual interviews with parties involved and witnesses who may have observed the alleged conduct or may have other relevant knowledge. And then finally, protection against retaliation. Your employees need to be able to trust that they can keep their job if they report discrimination to you. So saying something like, we will maintain confidentiality throughout the investigation. Retaliation against an individual for reporting harassment or discrimination or for participating in an investigation of a claim of harassment or discrimination is a serious violation of this policy and will be subject to disciplinary action. Acts of retaliation should be reported immediately and will be promptly investigated and addressed. So you need to just you need to follow through with this policy you can't just have it you need to actually enforce it let's talk a moment about dress code policies dress code policies set guidelines um, for what's appropriate to wear at work they could be set for safety reasons uh, for easy identification of employees or, or to present a specific image to the public Companies need to be careful, though, because dress codes can be easily classist, racist, or sexist. Classist dress code policies are those that require employees to wear business formal attire to work. This can often be a barrier for individuals from the lower working class who may not be able to afford that for their closet. Racist dress codes uh, policies have been around in the workplaces, schools, and restaurants for a very long time. I'm talking about braids, cornrows, twists, and dreadlocks. Not allowing headgear um, could be discrimination to those who wear them for religious reasons. Also requiring men to shave or ha hair to be cut could be against someone's religion. Discrimination in this way is a federal crime. Sexist dress code policies. Gender dress code policies required employees to dress according to perceived sex. As mentioned in our last webinar, there's a lot of people born intersex or between the sexes and they don't fit the standard definition of male or female. There's a ton of non-binary and trans people these policies push into boxes that don't perhaps associate with these. Um, some ex some uh, examples of gendered separate expectations would be men not being able to wear or men can't wear earrings, men can't wear makeup, and their hair must be cut short. Females uh, must be forced to wear heels, wear makeup, wear jewelry, wear skirts, wear stockings, or any other kind of elaborate or revealing outfits. Dress codes that disproportionately burden women could be grounds for a, discri a discrimination lawsuit. Makeup takes time. Pantyhose cost money and heels are painful. If you have a dress code, instead of separating it by gender, list articles of clothing or have other specifics instead. So let's go through a couple different types of examples of dress codes. Gender neutral dress codes um for casual dress codes casual dress is on the rise in the workplace according to indeed 50 percent of businesses now allow businesses uh now allow employees to dress casually every day 
Uh, an example of this would be dress comfortably to work, but please do not wear anything that could offend your coworkers or make them feel uncomfortable. That includes clothing with profanity, hate speech, or, or exclusionary language. Your clothing, while casual, should show some common sense and professionalism. Uh, business casual dress codes for gender neutral examples. Employees should dress in business casual attire, which could include casual slacks and skirts, uh, blouses or sweaters. Inappropriate attire includes sportswear, jeans, and unkempt clothing, among other options. Please exercise good judgment. And then an example of a gender neutral business formal dress code would be traditional business attire, including dresses, suits, and pantsuits is required for meeting with clients. Employees should use discretion on other occasions are in, and are expected to demonstrate good judgment. So it gives some specifics but of articles of clothing and how you should dress, but it doesn't say that men have to wear this and women have to wear another thing. Um, also, you can have standardized uniforms. This is a really great option as well, like having people wear all black or company polos or company aprons or t-shirts that you give them. Uh, tons of, tons of pop brands, you have your own merch and a lot of stores let their butt tenders wear merch to work too. So, um, that I feel like a t-shirt is pretty gender neutral and it's something that's really easy for an option. All right. Tools for increasing diversity. Use the personality assessment to recruit more diverse candidates. Uh, valid personality assessments are great tools to measure candidates' personality traits, motivations, and skills. They help create diversity because personality scores do not differ for minority group members. A study of 150 companies found that, that personality assessments in their hiring um, gave them a, a more racially diverse workforce. Use AI resume screening. There are automated programs that objectively and consistently rate criteria across all candidates. Use blind resumes. This takes information off of your um, your resume uh, to or someone's resume to include that could help remove unconscious bias from someone's perceived gender or their race. Um, this can also be done with technology. Viridian Staffing, a cannabis staffing agency that's also part of the Cannabis Alliance, does this as standard protocol when matching clients to potential employees. Have blind interviews. Um, this is a little bit harder to do, but you know, this is when you get a candidate to anonymously answer job related questions. You can do this on a phone, but that's harder to anonymize, but you can also do a written Q&A or you can do an anonymous chat of some kind. Use sourcing methods that diverse candidates use. Um, in general, women are, uh, LinkedIn found that women are less likely than men to rely on their personal networks during job searches and more likely than men to search on third party websites and online job boards. There's also groups on Facebook for particular demographics looking for jobs. Here's a Seattle Queer Jobs group with almost 7,000 queer people locally in this area. There's an LGBTQ professionals group with over 32,000 queer people. Have a virtual job fair. This is a really awesome option right now in current times when you can't be acting with people in person. I bet this could be really done easily with the Cannabis Alliance and this Remo app that they've been using um, recently. Strate strategically seed your pipeline with more diverse candidates. Re research has found from Harvard Business Review that um, 
if you only have one female candidate, they have virtually zero chance of getting hired. However, a two in the pool effect gives increasing odds to, um, to these women. Include diverse employees in the interview process. If it's possible, create a selection panel of diverse employees who sit in on the interviews and contribute to evaluations and discussions about the candidates. All right, so now that we got them, how do we keep them? When workplace inclusion and equity are made a priority, diverse talent is attracted and retained. You need effective onboarding. An uh, Aberdeen group report found that around 90 employees decide to stay or leave a company within the first six months of their employment. And for the cannabis industry, it's worse. 40% of bud tenders don't make it through their first month. 58% don't make it past two, and 84% don't make it more than three. This is from headset data. Onboarding should be done uh, more than just paperwork on your fir new hire's first day. Effective onboarding includes properly introducing the new employee to the rest of the team, helping them navigate their surroundings, and training them on the specific tools and processes that they need to do their job. Training. You need to train your staff. <laughs> you need real standard operating procedures. Please stop throwing people to the wolves. You need to have competent people who understand the law and understand cannabis representing you. Please take the time to adequately train your staff, please. Equal work deserves equal pay. There's not only a gender wage gap, but there's also a race wage gap. Offer inclusive benefits. We touched on a couple of these earlier, but um, yeah, a lot of gay couples, they're not married and have legal ambiguity towards their children. Um, I also really want to mention because the cannabis business, a lot of cannabis businesses do not provide medical insurance. It is a huge, huge barrier for trans people to get into the industry. Trans people need consistent coverage for mental health, hormone therapy, surgeries, and other treatments related to gender transition. Flexibility. Uh, we also mentioned this earlier. Companies that offer flexibility find it expands the recruitment of diverse employees, particularly single parents and employees with disabilities. Flexible schedules reduce absenteeism, improve employees' health, and increase the retention of productive employees. Access to leadership. All employees need to feel like they have access to leadership. People from diverse backgrounds especially need to know that they can have their voice heard without feeling singled out as representing only their perspective of their group. When leaders make themselves available for open dialogue and are present in those conversations, employees feel a greater sense of belonging. Foster a culture of trust. Take the time to listen to your employees and implement an environment where individuals feel safe to speak up about their experiences. By expressing an interest and understanding of individual experiences, leadership is more likely to learn about potential issues between staff members. Eliminating these, eliminating these issues before they become larger problems will leave organizations in a better position to retain talent, encourage diversity, and protect your reputation. Keep an open dialogue around social issues. This so shows that you care about issues impacting their lives outside of work. I know of a brand that told their staff that when Black, the Black Lives Matter protests started heating up, they weren't allowed to talk politics at work. Do you think that their employees of color felt supported? Not really. Stay interviews. Meet regularly with diverse employees employees to identify and reinforce positive reasons for them to stay. I'd say one hour meetings every six months is a pretty good idea. 
this is just management 101 here. Praise in public, coach in private. As a manager, you should be sensitive to how you deliver information. Praising your team in front of their peers makes them feel proud and accomplished. And criticizing them in front of their peers is degrading and humiliating. Pull people aside for conversations that should be private. I have personally taken people aside in inventory closets, like find a space, make it work. Make the path to growth transparent. Make sure everyone knows what opportunities are available and what competencies are needed to get to the next level. Post your job openings publicly in internal forums like company emails or Slack. When possible, promote from within. Promo promoting from within encourages people to work harder and it saves from making them feel passed up for the position. You also have people in higher positions who understand the facets of the lower positions even better. Uh, make sure your diverse employees understand what they need to do in order to be seen by uh, their superiors. Create a mentorship program. When new employees feel like they are, uh, there are people in the company who are specifically paired with them to help them succeed, they're more likely to stay. Set up new hires with mentors who will teach them and train them. Affinity groups. They might not be doable until you're a larger brand, but I would say that some of the larger players in the industry are totally uh, capable of doing this right now. Affinity groups are internal workplace groups of people with shared goals, backgrounds, or interests, and can be indispensable for diversity retention. Microsoft here has Gleam, the global LGBTQ employee, oops, and allies at Microsoft, um, plus five other organizations. Amazon has Glamazon for gays and lesbians at Amazon, plus 11 other minority organizations. Boeing has the Boeing Beagles. There's just a number of, uh, yeah, if you, if you have a group of people, a group of minorities, pull them together and let them come together and talk about the issues that they're facing and support each other within your workplace. Have inclusive calendars, calendars that feature things like your employees' birthdays, multi, multicultural holidays, and um, yeah, people love feeling recognized and celebrated. And if you recognize a holiday that's specific to them or you celebrate their birthday, that just means a lot to that one particular person. And um, it just makes them feel like they are cared about. Offer gender neutral restrooms. Employers need to provide a safe and convenient restroom for everyone. Single stall restrooms are oftentimes a great solution. Pronoun buttons. Normalize talking about your pronouns. I've come across a couple non-binary people in the industry and they should have their pronouns respected as should everyone. Um, I was working at a pot shop recently where someone was coming to work at our location for the day. And before they got there, other staff members were spreading the word that they uh, would be coming and that they used they, them pronouns. I th thought it was incredibly awesome for the staff to step up in that way and set the tone for inclusiveness even before that person got there. Pronoun signatures in emails. This is another fabulous way to normalize talking about pronouns and avoid accidentally misgendering someone. It's also a great way to spot allies, people we know, respect, and understand gender variations. Hold educational seminars. Take the time to learn about diversity and how, uh, how you can be a better brand. Do it as a team.
I've been putting together these workshops and webinars and I've been doing a lot and uh, we'll be doing a lot more in the future. And these are all being recorded so they'll be accessible in the future as well. Celebrate pride as a brand. I want to mention as a brand, as a cannabis brand, you cannot participate in parades because it can be seen as advertising to children. But um, organize, but we as, as organizations can and do participate in local pride parades and you as a brand can sponsor an organization like us, perhaps. Um, this is us at the Seattle Pride Parade uh, right before we changed our name. Make some limited edition pride shirts for your staff to wear, but make it optional. This is a shirt a cannabis lube company called Velvet Swing came up with a couple years ago. Uh, speak your support year round, not just during pride season, not just during Black Lives Matter protests. Be vocal all the time. Your minorities should feel like you care about them year round, not just pride season, not just when there's protests happening all the time. Use your platform to spread support. Make posts on your social media and memos on your website to let your staff and customers know where you stand. Here we have Netflix talking about their support for Black Lives Matter. Here's Ben and Jerry's talk about the disparities within the cannabis industry. Ikea posted this on Twitter celebrating um, and recognizing queer people in Idaho. And um, just a couple days ago, um, I wanted to show this. This is um, a PSA that the NFL came out with on National Coming Out Day just this last weekend. Today on National Coming Out Day, we come together with one clear message to all current players who are thinking of coming out. When you are ready, so are we. I support you. I got you. We got you. We got you. <laughs> the highs, the lows. We're teammates, we're brothers. We support you. It takes all of us. All of us. It takes all of us. And you deserve to be all of you. Yeah, I just, um, I saw that this last week and I just thought that was an incredible step an incredible move for the NFL to come out like that just because um sports have not always been the most inclusive place for um LGBTQ individuals but I love that they are taking a stand and using their platform to be vocal about these causes Take action. Don't just talk about your support on social media because that's called slacktivism. Actually get involved. Participate in uh, fundraising, volunteering, community events that support the LGBTQ community. We at the Full Spectrum regularly volunteer to make Meals with Lifelong's Chicken Soup Brigade program. We also encourage people to take part in the census and register to vote. Um, today actually is the very last day that you can be counted in the census, which won't be done again for another 10 years. So if you haven't done it yet, take this website and fill it out. Be counted so you can be represented in Congress. Some brands show their pride with special strains or packaging. Um, I want to talk briefly about corporate pandering and virtue signaling. Uh, some people have a big issue about this. Personally, I remember a time when the queer community was more stigmatized and not as well accepted. And uh, I honestly, I love that we've become a group worth pandering to. Like, um, they find our dollars worthwhile. They find us as like people that, you know, have money and, and, and 
participating, being vocal and open is good business for them. So um, personally, I don't mind the, the pandering so much, but just make sure that your corporate values are consistent so it's genuine. Don't be just making money off of minorities like that. Um, last year, Halo and Washington Budco teamed up for the Love is Love collaboration, which went to support Play They, um, which is a diverse queer and gender non-conforming performance group. Buddy's brand also donates part of their liquid diamonds sales to local LGBTQ organizations. Sales of Mr. Moxie's proud peppermints raise money for lifelong. The Reef closed their Seattle store to participate in the Black Lives Matter Day of Action March. They also raised fu uh, funds for the local chapter of the NAACP as well as COVID relief programs. Last year, PAX's Be a Force for Good campaign donated $50,000 to the GLBT Historical Society. Um, the Seattle Safe Space Program is a free voluntary program designed to assist victims of hate, bias, hate and bias crime and to encourage the reporting of these crimes. It's really important that assault is reported so police have accurate numbers. If you don't report it, they don't know it's happening. These are the commitments to taking part in the Seattle Safe Place business program. If a crime victim enters your premises, your staff should call 911 immediately on the victim's behalf. You should allow the victim to remain on your premises until the police arrive. If the victim leaves prior to the police arrival, Reconnect, uh, recontact 911 and update the operator with the victim's and or suspect's description and direction of travel. Uh, the GSBA is a fantastic local organization. Uh, it is the largest LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce in North America. There's over 1,300 businesses and organizations that are members. Um, but there's only three cannabis brands in their directory. Uh, they connect so many professionals, queer professionals, and they do so much work for good. One of their events that they do regularly is um, Young Professionals Pr with Pride, which I personally take part in. Um, because I believe it helps normalize cannabis within the professional realm. They also have other ventures like Women on Top, a fantastic sponsorship program, which I've also participated on the panel of, and professional development conferences. I wanna wrap things up with conflict resolution because how you handle conflict determines if employee performance increases or decreases. Conflict is going to happen. You just need to be able to handle it well. You need to address the situation immediately. Letting things linger lets them grow. It also makes your staff feel like you don't care about what they're trying to address. Privately talk with each person involved. There's always multiple sides to the story. Ask the other person to name a time when it would be convenient to meet. Arrange to meet in a place you won't be interrupted. Focus on behavior and events, not personalities. Say, when this happens, instead of when you do this, so it's not attacking. Describe a specific event instead of generalizing. Listen carefully. Careful listening is one of the best ways you can handle conflict. It allows you to validate others' ideas and let them know that they're being heard, regardless if you agree or not. Remember that you're not always right, and your ideas aren't necessarily the best. Remind your team of this as well. Listen to what other people are saying instead of getting ready to react. Avoid interrupting the other person. After the other person finishes speaking, 
Rephrase what was said to make sure you understand it. Ask questions to clarify that you understand. Remain calm. How we respond can intensify tension. Conflicts get, um, conflicts get heated when people become emotional and arguments become personal. Calmer minds produce clearer ideas. Insist everyone just relax and talk in a civil manner. Make sure no one shouts. Make sure they don't make offensive claims or blame. Identify points of agreement and disagreement. Summarize the areas that you agree and disagree. Ask if they agree with your assessment. Modify your assessments until both of you agree on the areas of conflict. Prioritize what's important for both of you to resolve. Develop a plan to work on each of these conflicts. Start with the most important thing, focus on the future, set up future meeting times to continue your discussions. Follow through with your plan. Just having a plan is no good. You need to follow through with it. Stick with the discussions until you've worked through each area of the conflict. Maintain a let's work out a solution kind of an attitude. Look out for opportunities to point out progress. Compliment the other person's insights and achievements. Congratulate each other when you make progress, even if it's just a small step. Your hard work will pay off when your discussions that you schedule will eventually turn into ongoing friendly communication. And that's all I have for this presentation. Be sure to like and follow us on all of our social medias. We do virtual smoke sessions pretty regularly, so please look out for those on our Facebook. Um, we also do work sesh Wednesdays every Wednesday at 2 p.m. to develop our organization into the global powerhouse we are meant to be.